So I have finished reading Star Wars Inquisitors Rise of the Red Blade by Delia S. Dawson. If you haven't read the book yet, I will be spoiling it in my review. But if you want a spoiler-free review, I did release a YouTube show that's just a quick spoiler-free review of it. Uh, it will be linked in the cards, description, and also comment section as well, so you can go check it out. Or you can just search for it on my channel. But just to recap, I saw this was a great read. It was exciting, intriguing. And even though our main character is Catacurus, right? Yeah, Iscat Arcarus. Uh, I'll just call her Iscat from here. But I've, even though Iscat is our protagonist, she's not a hero. Um, obviously, in the Inquisitors are not the hero of the Star Wars universe. But we are still rooting for her. We're rooting for her to overcome her struggles, to realize herself. Now, unfortunately, she is manipulated. She does is tempted by the dark side. She's, she becomes an Inquisitor after all. And from this point on in my review, there will be spoilers. There's no doubt about that. But before I go, I would like to just say, this is actually my second take of it. I like my first take. But I just realized there was so much I left out that I thought another take would be good. So some things will be changed up. But if you would like to see my original take, if you support me on as a YouTube channel member, you will get access to that at any tier. Whether you're, you're a member for Dawn 99 months, a Jedi Knight for 499 months, or a Starfleet Captain for 999 months. All those tiers, you get to see my original version of this review. But back to the review now. So as I said, Iskat becomes an Inquisitor, but she starts out as a Jedi like all the Inquisitors did. And most of the story is actually her as a Jedi dealing with her struggles with the dark side, trying to find to center her focus, but she keeps on failing. She finds she's the most centered when she's in combat. And you no know, and she's more and she likes taking action. You know what? Sometimes that is the case. Sometimes people do like more taking action. But the dogma, the systematic stuff of the Jedi Order failed to. No, they tell her, find your center, calm down, don't act rashly. But do they actually give her the actual support she needs? Her master dies before her eyes in the battle of Geonosis. And they, no, they tell her she's one with the force now, all that. But at the same time, it's like, they're wanting her to go from, basically skip all the stages, all the things in the stages of grief, which are not perfect, mind you, but... Just, you accept it for what it is. But Jedi Masters and Padawans have an attachment. And you, the Jedi do shun attachments, but they do encourage an attachment between Master and Apprentice. And grand part of that is learning to let go, but as we will, probably most Jedi Masters and Apprentices, um, when they when they separate, it's on no, it's because the Padawan is now a Jedi Knight. And so it's an, it eases them, not violence. V literally, the severing of Iskat's um, a ma apprentice, master apprentice bomber for master is through violence, through death. And she's not equipped to handle that. She's not been trained to handle it. She knows what she is, that she needs to not let go. And even though she didn't have the best relationship with her master, she never felt a connection with her master. She still struggled. And so there was an attachment there, and she convinced that her master only is uh, only ex only took her on on as a padawan because she felt pity for her. So you can already see her at this early on. She's not in the man best mental place. Not to mention when she was still training, she she um, used her powers too much and accidentally hurt her her best friend and ended up being shunned by all the other Jedi initiates. And her friend sounds like they didn't survive the injuries. Now, we do get more in the sense of that scene later on, but I still wonder because uh, how accurate it is. Because is Iskat who were following a reliable narrator, especially in the later parts of the book? I would say most of your time as a Jedi, what we're reading though is fairly accurate. At least I think so. But who knows? Like, at what point does she become an unreliable narrator? Does she become an unreliable narrator? And that's the thing, because when oftentimes when you're following a a um a non-hero, a villain, as your protagonist, you do run the risk of them being that unreliable narrator. It is a risk that you take 
and can create good stories, and I think this is a great chance. But the only way I think we can find out is Iskap being an unreliable narrator is to see the story from another perspective. Um, I don't know who that would be. Maybe maybe the other Jedi character, um, it, um, gotta make sure I look it up correctly. I'm bad with Star Wars names. Too long? It is, he might be, it might be interesting to get his perspective on the story. But yeah. So like, so I think I cover a lot of the basic stuff that this cat is struggling with. She's struggling with the dark side even as a young Jedi. And the Jedi don't give her the support she needs. Which is exactly the same thing that happens with many Jedi during the Clone Wars. The Jedi are stretched thin. And the and Jedi who are struggling with the dark side, with grief, whoever may be, are not being given the necessary support. Now that is what Emperor Palpatine, oh future Emperor Palpatine, that is what Darth Sidious wants. He wants Jedi being tempted by the dark side. He wants them spread sin so that way Order 66 can be as effective as possible. And like there's a point in the book where, where it actually gets to escort Palpatine, chance, then chance of Palpatine to the Jedi High Council Chamber for meeting with them. And you can tell, tell reading that like Palpatine's taking an interest in her. I wonder why. Because he, he sensed the struggling darkness in her. And he knew if he pushed the right buttons, he could manipulate her to the dark side. The exact same thing that he did with Anakin, the exact same thing he did with the Green Inquisitor, with Frosted Dibs, with another character in this book, um, who's just a, a, I'll just jump ahead, a, 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 um, a Jedi initiate who failed the trials, never became a Jedi, never became a Padron, but was given a role as a droid uh, mechanic in there. He probably manipulated him as well. Like, Palpatine is a master manipulator. He sees the Jedi he wants, and he does subtle things, making them more amenable to him, so that way when the transition comes, he could p convince them to join him, become an Inquisitor. Well, he had different plans for Anakin, of course, but it's got doing Order 66, which I gotta say, that seems like, it's like, what happened? And then I, like, Order 66. But interesting to note, this guy was on a mission at the time with three Jedi. What, Tulan, who she's worked with before, um, the last mission actually had gone well, though so he did kind of lie for her, but also some credit at the same time, but it's kind of interesting, but he did keep her from being, you no, know, you no, know, locked up in the temple for another two years, and instead of out there fighting on the front lines, helping it, helping the war effort, so there's there, but the first mission actually did not go that well, because she acted a little more rashly, and he also... Lost a, uh, was it his mask? No, not his mask, I think. But regardless, the first mission, she got locked in the temple for basically two years because of her rash acting. And the Jedi were desperate and they thought, nope, we're going to keep her out of the fighting, which maybe to keep her away from the dark side, but at the same time, maybe you should give her better aid. Again, showing how the dogma of the Jedi is failing the Jedi. Um, and how things, and I do want to talk about how things might have been different in the Hyper but let's get back to that Order 66 scene. So her turn on another Jedi was there. The, the third Jedi, who, I forget the name, but the clones, the, that Jedi was more of a the clones killed them quickly. That first Jedi, dead, as soon as Order 66. But Tulon and Iskat survive a bit longer. Iskat is actually given up to him by Palpatine to, you know, basically leave the Jedi, join him. She doesn't quite realize it's Palpatine at first, but yeah, she takes up the offer and she walks away, leaving Tulon behind. And then the clones start firing on Tulan. Now, I do want to say, spoilers, big spoilers, Tulan does survive. Now, he's left for dead by the clones, but through anger, anger at Iskat leaving him to die, he survives. He basically embraces the dark side, and he does become an Inquisitor, the tenth brother. And, and he's mad at Iskat, literally stabs her at one point, no, to get even, definitely to get even, but once they, uh, and probably she didn't, probably because of the fact that she had, uh, her species has two hearts, probably why she survived, but after that, they become close as Inquisitors. Quite close. By the way, I'm not going to reveal Iskat's Inquisitorious name yet, because if you read the Darth Vader comics, you might know what's coming next, especially when I, especially because of the other thing they said. But anyhow, as an Inquisitor, she also is still feeling an outcast. Let's mention more once. She fires an outcast as a Jedi and she's feeling an outcast as the Inquisitor. Because 
she feels like un because an interesting thing though, she joined the Inquisitors voluntarily. She does not seem like she was broken down like any of the other former Jedi were. Now, she was broken down in her own way, but she did not need torturing to be convinced. No. She had the Jedi taught her patience and she used that patience to actually her advantage as an Inquisitor, you know, being patient while they were maybe trying to break her down or you know, dis you know basically figure out what's going on. She used that patience to her advantage. So actually at one point that droid mechanic that probably also also a manipulator who she told a lot to when as a Jedi. Yeah, she killed him as an Inquisitor because she because he violated her trust by telling Palpatine that stuff. They an Inquisitor move. But and but eventually she takes the opportunity, um she bests the which sister which Inquisitor, um the mirror on and every sound Star Wars levels. Eventually would best her in combat, so after getting injured, of course. Best her in combat then get injured because the the that that night sister <laughs> night sister that Inquisitor took advantage of using her droids to basically not in a fight but to subterfuge Injure is cat. Yeah. But. So that. <laughs> ends up happening. And they got. A fierce rivalry going. But eventually. Is. Is cat decides to go. And cause. She found out the name of the plane. Her species comes from. She goes there. She learns. A little bit more about her. Her. Her people. That she can't fit in there. And neither did her mother. Her mother. Was. Was a Jedi named Freya. Who. Who failed to become a pad one. Though was friends with with Iskat's Jedi Master um, Simba, Simba, and so Freya returns to her home planet, but she's not fitting in. You know, she's been trained as a Jedi. That's what she knows. She just can't fit in with her home. And eventually, Iskat is born. She gets in contact with the Jedi, and Freya is gives Iskat over to Sem Simba to take to the Jedi. And that is something interesting to know. And not to mention. Simba kept is if kept Faya's lightsaber as well, which was one of the big things that first sparked um, Iskat's curiosity a little more into her past and why does her master have this lightsaber? Not to mention Faya was the last name her master spoke before she died. Not Iskat, not her padron, but Faya. I have a feeling Faya and and um, Simba were close, good friends, maybe, maybe more. I don't know, but they were definitely close because Simba, Jelly who. Uh, who as good guys that pretty but will follow who didn't keep much did keep that one thing Faya's lightsaber so that is something interesting to note this guy eventually as an inquisitor goes to her home planet and learns about her people but how she won't fit in just like a mother because her own people don't know what happened to Faya because sometime after after um, Iskat left she just wandered and wandered away and they never saw her again they, we don't they they don't know and Iska at that point don't know. But on her first official mission as an Inquisitor, she sent to hunt down two Jedi. She doesn't give their names or anything, but on the same planet, she meets up with, with Tulan again, and who's also hunting a, a Jedi on the same planet, which was probably not a coincidence. The Grand Inquisitor and Vader probably knew there were three Jedi on the planet. They sent both these two Inquisitors who had to pass together as a Jedi, probably to test them. They definitely had some hatred toward each other one time, but at the same time would seem to be flirting. Yes, they were flirting. But yeah, they but Iskat eventually finds the three Jedi. One was a, a fellow Jedi that she trained in that that was in her group and that she definitely had a rival with. I think Iskat was a bit jealous of how perfect she was in some ways. But at the same time the other Jedi, she wasn't perfect. Charlie, I think was her name. She was not perfect. No. She let maybe she disguised it well, but maybe her fear at Iskat and Iskat's more aggressive behaviors, cloud her, um, let her put down Iskat, maybe without intending to, maybe trying to help Iskat, but not in a healthy way. Well, Iskat toys with her, then kills her. Then another Jedi, just who we don't know anything about, a Doutrin, I think it was, but then she meets, she finds the third Jedi, who did escape his cell, um, do I, I want to check his name. Yeah, and that, that Jedi trained, I guess, was um, Charlin. But yeah, it was uh, Master Cliffin. And he is basically, she has, a, this guy has the longest conversation with her, including revealing what happened to her mother. 
what happened is her mother and content warning, there is a content warning at the beginning of the book for this, but her, Iskat's mother had committed suicide, took her own life because she, you know, she didn't, she, she was not welcomed among the Jedi anymore because she washed out and didn't accept a civilian position and she also couldn't fit in with her own people. Now Iskat did in the back of mind think, once Galaxy's at peace, yeah right, um, she would, she could potentially return to her people and maybe take up a leadership role, maybe even more of a warrior role, which her people did not have being pacifists. Interesting enough. But yeah, there's something interesting there to note as well, but she learns that from her master's master, and her master, and all the Jedi she killed did not realize she had fallen to the dark side yet. But, but, um, well, I'm bad at Star Wars names, by the way, and I don't want to get some things confused. Yeah, Claire Fawn. She duels him, you know, when, and once he realizes, now he tries to talk her out of the thing, the dark side's corrupting and all that, but she's not listening. She has no ability to listen anymore. And maybe if they had, you know, given her better advice, had supported her better when she was struggling as a Jedi, she might have listened. Or if she was more trained in the way High Republic was. Because in, in the High Republic, you can definitely tell the Jedi behaved differently. They were much more um, supportive. They were much more understanding, compassionate. Things that they lost, uh, or as they felt, and as the galaxy went into the Clone Wars, and during the Clone Wars. In fact, that's what Palpatine wanted. By, no, in a sense, the Jedi fell into Palpatine's tra trap perfectly. Palpatine knew about them, knew about the fear dark side, and pulled the right strings, got them into war, got them desperate, and they didn't give the attention they needed, the proper attention they needed to Jedi who was who was suffering, who was struggling with the dark side. Now, like, imagine how things might have gone differently if a Jedi told you, that thing you're feeling, that's pulling at you, that's the dark side. It's dangerous, it's corrupting. You, get, you gotta push it away, otherwise it will consume you and destroy who you are totally. It may trick you, it may want to make you think it's gonna help you, but it won't. But they never told her that. And that hurt her in the end. That turned her into an Inquisitor in a sense. But yeah, she duels her master's master and kills him as well. And when she returns back to the Inquisitorial headquarters, which at that time, during the, when the book is said, still on course, it hasn't moved to move to Fortress Inquisitorius yet. But that is when she finally, said, when she returns, gives the lightsabers and the other trinkets that she plundered from the world those three Jedi were being imprisoned by a bounty hunter that she also killed. That's when she takes her Inquisitor name. She gives her three lightsabers and some other trophies besides the ones she kept for herself, like any good Inquisitor would. And that's when she takes her Inquisitor, Inquisitor name, like I've been saying. The 13th sister. She'd been assigned it, but she didn't want, she wasn't ready to accept it yet. Which at least is something. No, no. Hey, I'm not, I gave this to me, but I won't claim it until I feel comfortable using it. That's actually good on her. That's basically where the book ends besides the epilogue. And if you read one of the Darth Vader comics, you know what's going on, I think. Because I mentioned Tulan, he was the 10th brother. Iskad's a 14th sister, red skin. And they both, and actually, they both created a tradition of after after defeating Jedi, they would sample a local beverage, normally alcohol, of the alcoholic kind, from the the planet that they killed the Jedi on. It started because, well, when, after Iskat killed that bounty hunter that was, cap that was in prison, those three Jedi, she found his little throne room and found the drink. She tried it and that's how the, it, it started. And apparently all the other Inquisitors thought that was a bit of a childish tradition. Yeah, I can kind of understand why. And, oh, and I uh, should say Iskat and Tulan definitely were acting on the feelings. They were, no, probably the van floating with the Inquisitor, but they definitely became lovers, and Vader sensed it. And we saw that how that played out in the comics, and it's played out exactly the same way in the book. There's no way about it. It couldn't change. It was locked in. But man, it, reading the episode, it's like, you could tell that. It's still through Iskat's perspective again. We don't know how reliable of a narrator she is at this point, but assuming she is, it feels like she, well, she definitely embraced the dark side. The dark side never consumed her like it. Probably did the, like the fifth brother and all that. And probably much more like the Grand Inquisitor in a sense, you know. Much more control over the dark side. Vader, Palpatine, Vader, Palpatine, Emperor. 
pretty probably that, but yeah. But yeah, Sidious, Vader, and the Grand Inquisitor all have control over the dark side. Not, not, they would not, and I think it's got my been on her way to controlling the dark side as well. Because she, she needed to be broken down, but she was not broken down in the same way, way as the other Inquisitors who torture and all that. But at the same time, it's like, because of that, that she might have been able to overcome it with the right motivations. And who knows, but she and Turon, they tried to run away, knowing that they either had to run away or defeat Vader, because there's no other way they're going to survive now that Vader decided, nope, you're not having a relationship. Doesn't work. Vader uses the Force, and they kill each other. Which also kind of reminds me a bit of Romeo and Juliet, a love that was not to be. But yeah, in some ways I wish we could have gotten the story to continue, but it couldn't. It was locked in. It's a tragedy. Star Wars and Crystal, Rise of the Red Blade, is a tragedy. I mentioned Romeo and Julia, but yeah, it's a tragedy of a Shakespearean sense. This character, in an effort, in a sense, to avoid her fate, the Jedi created the fate. Um, well, I think that might have been a Greek tragedy as well, but Shakespearean tragedy definitely does take some some keys from Greek tragedy. But yeah, the idea of, you know, you try to avoid your fate, that's what created it. Just like Anakin becoming Vader. And I, and I gotta say, I think this guy might suspect Vader's identity only because she's... The first time she met Vader, besides the fact that Vader crushed her hand, broke, breaking all the bones, is that they, that she did sense a, a familiar presence. Now, she only met Anakin once or twice. I actually met Ahsoka more than she met Anakin, but she can, you can tell that she's like, this, there's something familiar. So she had very much, very least, know that Anakin, or that Vader was a Jedi. Whether she knows it was Anakin or not, it's hard to say. But Anakin, Iskat, they're all the Grand Crystal, Foster Dibs, like I said, all victims of Palpatine's manipulation to fall, have them fall to the dark side. And you know what? That's probably the key, key thing I want you, you to take away from the book. That Iskat's story is that of tragedy. Just like Anakin, just like the Grand Crystal, every Inquisitor, every, almost every dark side except for Palpatine is somehow a tragedy. It's Maybe if they got the right support in Jedi, they might have been avoided. But the thing is, Palpatine was manipulating from the beginning. In the Jedi, Iskat, Anakin, they never stood a chance. There's a reason why why it's called, the song is called Duel of the Fates, with the duel between, Obi, between Darth Maul and then Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn. The fate of the galaxy was being decided in that moment. The duel of the fates, the fate of the galaxy, was a phantom menace. Palpatine going to succeed or not? He succeeded. Qui-Gon was struck down. And, okay, it's not guaranteed that Qui-Gon might have avoided Anakin's fall to the dark side, but the thing is, in that the fate of the galaxy was sealed. The, there was only one course of action now. The Jedi who had the best chance of helping Anakin avoid a fall to the dark side was slain. And, and sure, it, that probably didn't affect Iskat in any bit at all, any bit. But, this is key here in my opinion, is that once Anakin's fate was sealed, the fate of all future Inquisitors were also sealed. Palpatine had what he wanted. He had, he, he probably didn't know he needed to get rid of Qui-Gon Jinn, but by getting rid of Qui-Gon Jinn, Palpatine was in the perfect place to succeed. And because of all his manipulation prior to do the fate and afterwards, Everything was in place. There was nothing left for the Jedi to do. Short of Qui-Gon actually manifesting a lot earlier than he actually did to Yoda through the, through the Force. And that's why the prequel trilogy as a whole is a tragedy. It's Anakin's tragedy, but Christopher's Rise of the Red Blade is Iskat's tragedy. Now, I do want to address a few other things too. Mostly the Easter egg variety, because come on. So I mentioned that Iskat's the 13th sister and Tulan's the 10th brother and we saw the end art play out in the comics, the Darth Vader comics. But there's many other things. I also mentioned Prosser Dibs, who's actually the only other Inquisitor whose name is given, meaning Iskat knew, knew who he was. But the second sister is also mentioned. You might know her if you played Star Wars Jedi for an order as Trilla. I, I just love that little mention there. Um, the fifth brother who we saw in Rebels and in Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think Seventh Sister is the, the, the male Inquisitor that we saw in, in Rebels as well. So we see her, another callback there. 
and I forget that Inquisitor's name, I'm, but the Eternal Django Jumper, who we also saw in Star Wars Rebels. I mean, that's where the Inquisitors were first seen, of course, Grand Inquisitor. And many other names I mentioned that we've seen at various other points as well. I just don't remember who, which Jedi they were or which stories they appeared in. But let's talk about some references more as during the Jedi. Ahsoka Tano and Pong Crow were mentioned, mainly in regards to, to when Iska decided to learn how to wield two lightsabers. Obviously, those are the two probably best people for that. So Ahsoka does pick it up a bit later, but yeah. It's like the idea of Pong Crow. And I guarantee you, if if Dogma had not shot Pong Crow, he would have been an Inquisitor as well. I guarantee you that. But that's a different video. Not talking about this book. But very much like Iskat, he had his forms to Jedi and fell to the dark side. Of course, he fell a lot sooner than she did. Um, but yeah, like I said, though I, can't, I couldn't help but notice all those parallels between Iskat and Anakin. You know, struggling with the dark side, and just not, and no, the mothers and all that, and not giving the proper support. And probably if both of them had lived in the High Republic or Qui Gon had survived, things would have gone differently for them individually or in def and possibly the galaxy as a whole. But that's why, like I said earlier, this story, like the prequels, is a tragedy. The Fall of the Jedi is a tragedy. It's not just a drama, it's not just an action adventure, it is a tragedy. Like the Greek tragedies are old, and and also you like Shakespeare's tragedies as well. But that's all I got for you today. I would love to hear your thoughts on Star Wars Inquisitor: The Rise of the Red Blade by Dalia S. Dawson in the comment section down below. Also, if you would like to see my original version of this video, chain all channel members do get access to that. That video will actually be going live the same time as this video does. So go check that out if you're so interested. And as always, have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the force be with you, always. Thank you for watching this video, I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to give this video a like as well as subscribe to my channel and ring that bell to stay up to date on my latest content. Also, be sure to check out the link tree in the description as well as any other links I have down there.